Children ought not wander in the light of the crimson moon, for it is the gloam of the sanguine sky that the hounds of hell roam the shadows, hunting for innocent and lost souls on which to feast their faded maws. Mother often spoke that ominous warning to my brother, Kalen, when we were growing up. Even though it sent chills down my spine to hear the words, I never knew what she really meant by it. Every few years, when the time of the red skies came, there were never any signs of skulking demoniac beasts seeking to scoop us up. On the contrary, mother and father held fantastic parties. Several of the grown-ups from our church would come, dressed in the finest suits and the most beautiful gowns. They would dance and sing, laugh and drink brandy. Nasty stuff, brandy. A boy from our church dared me to take a sip a few years back and I spat it out almost immediately. This year, it was decided that Kaelin was too big for Mother to carry around all night. As such, he became my responsibility. I was to watch him and take care of him while the grown-ups attended the party. The night rolled onward, music ringing out from the parlor and filling the house with an air of otherworldly enchantment. My brother and I, along with four other children, stayed in the basement and entertained ourselves with games and told rhymes around Kaelin's zoetrope. It was around three hours past midnight when the Garnet moon was painting the sky into its deepest burning shades, that we all began to separate and grow tired of each other's company. Kaylin and I had gone off by ourselves to a secret play area we had previously established in the storeroom by the kitchen. Here I idly toyed with my collection of marbles while Kaylin watched absentmindedly from atop a wooden crate in front of the lone, plain window. Windows were in every way off-limits during the cycle of the Red Moon. The more public rooms of our home were blocked off with the lovely silken sheets that mimicked the hues of the sky outside. Under no circumstances was one to even catch a glimpse of the night outside. This was another rule that I never fully understood and saw no real harm in letting my puerile sibling violate it. And so, I resolved to share a special moment of secret rebellion with Kaelin where we could peek out at the vermilion horizon and take in sights where we were never meant to see. Puppy! Kaelin cooed excitedly, suddenly, startling me out of my near-hypnotic allure of the city beyond our window. I quickly scanned the area for the pup that had drawn my young sibling's attention, but saw nothing. I assumed he had spied one of the wild mutts that occasionally wandered into town after dark in search of food. I excused myself to use the restroom, after trying in vain to coerce the four-year-old to accompany me. How much trouble could one toddler get into inside a small pantry, I convinced myself. And with that, I made my way out down the hall to relieve myself. It was only while washing up after that a strange sense of creeping anxiety took hold of me. I quickly made my way back to the pantry, telling myself along the way that I had enough of tonight's celebration and that it was high time Kaylin and I had gone to bed. When I opened the door to the pantry, my heart plummeted and sent waves of cold terror coursing through me. Kalen was precisely where I had left him, standing on the old crate, gazing out through the window, which was now raised to its fully open position. But it was what stood beyond the window gazing back at him that had stolen my senses and frozen me in an icy panic, just outside the wide portal, lurched a massive beast. It was covered in matted, greasy black fur, and its long, snouted face resembled that of a hound or a wolf. The window stood around two meters up from the floor, and was, itself, around that height. The dog-like thing slouched severely on its hind legs and must have stood more than four meters tall when fully upright. The thing's long, sinewy forelimbs hung down and seemed to almost reach the ground. Worst of all were the beast's eyes, milky gray and seemingly long dead. They stared vacuously at my brother. The thing seemed to sway softly as it eyed Kalen. To my horror, 
Its drooling, filthy maw had twisted into what I could only describe as a sick, malicious grin. I stared, paralyzed in pure terror for what seemed like hours. Before I knew it, however, reality caught up with me in a crashing, torrential tidal wave of pure terror. With a blinding speed, the thing snapped forward and caught Kalen between his small neck and shoulders with its massive jaws and ripped him through the window and out into the night. Shaken from my delirium, I raced to save him but could not cross the distance in time. In an instant, the small screaming child and his hulking bestial captor had disappeared into the dense alleyways beyond our house. I choked out a sob for my brother. He was my responsibility and I had failed him. An inferno of pure hatred for the thing and for my own failures burned through my veins. Riding the adrenaline high, I raced blindly through the house. Before I had fully realized my actions, I found myself marching out of my parents' master bedroom, father's flintlock in hand. It was when I passed the parlor on my way back to the window, where the thing had stolen my brother, that I paused. I'd heard my mother's inebriated laughter sounding out amongst the sounds of music, as well as the dull roar of her guests. I sighed solemnly. The adults would be of no help. Most of them that I could see could barely stand, let alone track a beast through the whining streets of town. If they even believed me to begin with, that is. Setting my jaw, I continued back to the pantry and, after only a moment's hesitation, climbed out of the window and into the cobblestone alley beyond. Looking around, I shuddered, the sound of my footsteps reverberating off of the cold stone walls, sent anxiety's cold fingers tickling up my spine. I saw, to my dismay, a well-defined trail of Kalen's blood spattering off into the distance. My grip on the pistol tightened and I followed the dog-like thing's trail. I would never get my brother back, I thought. And if not, I would kill the abomination that took him from me. Even if doing it, and more so doing it alone, meant that I might not come back. The twisting alleys and paths of the town felt ever more labyrinthian in the ruby glow of that sickeningly sinister blood moon. Shadows loomed along, threatening to swallow me into their outstretched grasp. With every sharp angle, my heart beat faster, anticipating that horrid, mongrel beast to leap out and claim me like it had Kalen. My spine went rigid and my blood turned to ice as a long, discordant sound rang out and echoed over the rooftops. It took me a moment to recognize it as a kind of unholy amalgam of a scream and a bestial howl. It had to be the thing that took Kalen. Taking a deep breath, I set out at a light jog, determined to find the horror before it crawled back into whatever fetid pit it had come from. I trotted up the stone steps to the town's main square. As I came to the top, I had gotten my wish. And dear God, how I wish I hadn't. The dog-like thing was there, its back to me. I could see the sickly, mangy flesh running up its spine, hair, or I suppose fur, clustered itself in matted bunches and glinted wet in the red lunar light. I could see now that its legs were as unnaturally long as its arms had been when I would first laid eyes on it. It was hunched over something, someone, and its gangling limbs lurched out in awkward angles so as to bring its face low. I steeled myself and crept slowly towards the feasting creature, raising father's flintlock level to my eye, and aimed directly at the beast's center mass. As I neared, the thing seemed to jerk its canine face to the side and letting out a kind of mucousy hacking, as if some thick ichor were caught in its throat. With its head pulled away, I could see just who it had been gorging itself on. Kalen's pale face frozen and a mix of agony and horror gazed at me from beneath the crouching giant. Blood vessels in his right eye had broken, giving it a bulging, black look in the shadows. His face bore monstrous gashes down one side and his silvery blonde hair was caked in gore. Below the neck, it was hardly possible to distinguish as a body. Viscera and half-chewed organs lay in a loose pile. The pool of my baby brother's blood had seeped into the cracks of the cobblestone and began to spread in awkward geometric patterns. I let out a sharp gasp at the sight of Kalen's mutilation, 
Immediately, the greasy, dog-like creature's long ears perked up, and its head snapped impossibly fast to face me. The creature's maw curled into that same sickening grin I had seen before it had taken Kalen, and its body slowly shifted in my direction. From deep within its throat, a guttural, almost chuckling sound crept out and wove tendrils of chilling fear throughout my being. I cocked the hammer of Father's flintlock and desperately tried to steady my tremorous hands. The dog-like beast reared up on its hind legs and stood to its full height, its spine and joints letting out a stomach-churning series of cracks and snaps. It turned its head to gaze at the crimson moon and inhaled deeply, the pustule-ridden, greasy skin of its underbelly expanding and splitting in places as it filled its lungs. The thing returned its gaze to my frozen form and unleashed a terrible roar whose sound was only made worse by the reverberations off the stone walls and pathways of the square. The sound wormed its way deep inside my skull, threatening to shred my eardrums with the same veracity and savagery that the beast itself had torn into Kalen. I felt a wave of dizziness and a queer sense of nausea while the thing howled its nightmarish cry. Before I knew it, my legs had gone limp and the earth quickly rose up to meet my fainting body. As shadows rushed in from the corners of my vision to claim me, I used every bit of strength that could muster to squeeze the trigger of the pistol, sending a shot lightning fast into the monster's shoulder and causing it to shriek in pain. The ringing echo of the gunshot mixed with the dog-like bellows fused awkwardly together and faded out in time with my steadily receding consciousness. The morning after was, for the most part, a haze. A constable woke me and returned me to my home where I was examined by our family physician. The news of Kaylin's death was broken to my mother and father, who collapsed at the loss of their son. I told mother my story, of how the dog-like thing had taken Kaylin, and how I had gone to rescue him. She only cried harder and cursed my idiocy. I tried for nearly a quarter of an hour to get any information on just what the beast was and why it had taken my brother. I also couldn't comprehend just why nobody was talking about the mangled, horrible state his body had been left in. It was as if nobody cared, or at the very least weren't surprised by it. She never faltered, however. She never spoke a word. It was at Kaylin's funeral that things began to feel more real and less like the wispy fog of confusion that arises when trying to recall a dream. The family was gathered closest to the coffin, as Caitlin was lowered into the ground. Nearest us were our close friends and members of our church. I remembered peeking around during the final prayer and seeing someone peculiar standing off in the distance, beneath a gnarled oak tree. We made eye contact and he seemed to acknowledge me in a way as if to express his condolences, the man beneath the tree was the former reverend of our church. I didn't know much about him. His mother said he had been excommunicated nearly 16 years prior. She never explained the reason for his removal, just that he was an unclean soul and not fit to lead a congregation as tight-knit and devout as that of our church. Reverend Dutoit had become something of a local boogeyman in the time since his separation from the church. Children passed stories around that if you misbehaved or wandered into the streets at night, that Dutoit would snatch you up and take you back into his estate on the hill overlooking town. Rumors could occasionally be heard that he'd bought strange herbs and ingredients from the town's apothecary and conducted strange experiments deep in the bowels of his home, though nobody could ever say for sure that this was the case. It was always an instance of a friend of a friend of a friend told me. Seeing Dutoit at a funeral wasn't particularly odd, especially given that he'd known my parents during his tenure at the church. One thought did strike me as peculiar, however, and had teased the corners of my thoughts during our return home. It nagged at me just enough that before the sun had begun to set in the amber evening sky, I had again climbed through my window and crept my way through town. As I stood at the base of the hill atop which Detroit's decrepit old estate rested, eyeing the torn, twisted state of the front gate, I was only more certain of my suspicions. When I had eyed the aged man at the cemetery, his right arm and shoulder had been wrapped in a sling, the same arm that I had shot the beast in, as if to cement my growing hunch further 
The bandaged fabric was noticeably stained a deep red tinge. Of course. That's why he had been removed from the church and why the townspeople vilified him. That's what Mother meant when she called him unclean. Detroit was the dog-like thing that took my brother away from me. Whatever rituals he practiced, whatever experiments he was attempting, I would make him face justice for what he had done. I would confront him. Reverend Detroit's home bore an even stronger sense of disrepair upon closer inspection. The stonework was moss-ridden and cracked. The wood of the front porch appeared dry and skeletal, as though it could crumble to dust and ash at any moment. The windows, however, were fitted with thick iron bars that felt starkly dissimilar to the rest of the ancient structure. I circled the outside, wanting to ensure an inconspicuous point of entry in order to catch the vile man-beast off guard. As luck would have it, a small, almost child-sized window into the structure's basement stuck out around the back of the house and was unguarded by the thick, wrought iron of the other portholes. Sharp, weedy grass poked down and cut my arms as I tried to force the window open. Despite my pulling, however, the glass would not come free. In frustration, I struck out at the old pane, resolving to shatter it and forego my element of surprise. To my horror, the window did not shatter, but instead collapsed inward, my forward momentum pulling me down into the hazy shadows below. I cascaded down further than I had anticipated the cellar to be, and crashed hard onto an old wooden table, splintering it in two with the force of my impact. My head rang out and my body cried in agony. I had landed awkwardly on my wrist and felt a sharp snapping as my weight collapsed on top of it. I tried desperately to subdue my cries of pain, but to no avail. Surely the Reverend had heard the clatter and it would find himself upon me at any minute. The thought of being discovered by the wretched holy man fueled my body with an adrenal intensity, forcing me to my feet and to stagger my way toward any kind of exit. Feeling around in the murk, I eventually came upon a thick iron door. I leaned against the cold metal and tried to catch my breath before continuing, only to be met with a sound that set my teeth on edge. The sound of a woman's soft sobbing. I listened intently for a moment. And yes, I could clearly hear a quiet whimper coming from the room beyond the thick metal door. I felt around blindly for a handle and pulled hard. The door rattled noisily in its frame. I had been barred from the outside. Fumbling frantically, I removed the heavy wooden door jam and pulled once more. The hinges groaned in protest before giving away, and the heavy metal cried awfully as it slid against the old stone floor. I had completely forgotten about being noiseless. It was almost entranced by the weeping woman. When the door was open wide and enough for me to fit through, I slipped inside and felt my stomach drop with such force that I had to lean back on the frame to steady myself. The room was dimly lit by a lantern sitting on a table to my immediate left. The surface was also riddled with glass files of varying sizes, each containing different liquids. In the dull light, I could see that most appeared thick and viscous, and no two were the same color. There were surgical utensils as well, rusted scalpels, blades, and hypodermic needles making up the most of them. There were books open to seemingly random pages, all depicting intricate and complicated looking formula. In the center of the room, a large medical table was covered in sheets that were stained with what appeared to be large, dark splotches. The floor surrounding the table was splattered with dried blood. Beyond the table, bound by large shackles at her wrists and ankles, was a young woman. A teenager. Her auburn hair hung down into her face and looked as though it hadn't been cut in years. She was wearing a dingy nightgown that I was sure had been white long ago, but had now been ruined with grime, sweat, and other bodily filth. Her skin had been rubbed raw where the shackles gripped her, indicating that she had been imprisoned here for quite some time. The exposed flesh looked sickly and infected, dotted by small pustules that seemed to weep a foul ichor if she moved too rapidly. As her head drifted wearily to her left side, I could see a distinct and fresh wound that turned my blood to ice. Between her breast and collarbone, 
was a deep circular lesion surrounded by blackening bruised flesh. This girl had been the victim of a gunshot. I swallowed hard and the girl looked up at me. Her eyes were sunken, small trails of blood trickled from her tear ducts. Her pupils had collapsed, giving her eyes an inhuman and animalistic look, only accented by the bulging blood vessels in her sclera. The pale skin of her face seemed to be stretched thin over her skull. She looked like she hadn't eaten a decent meal in weeks. I expected her to be relieved that seeing someone who could help her would start her begging me to free her, but she only glared at me with a feral intensity. When I reached out to her and tried to speak, she flew into a rage and began screaming an unholy awful sound. She flailed her arms and kicked her legs, rattling her chains violently. I felt my knees go weak and found myself crawling backwards on the floor in abject horror. Her frenzied cries and wild behavior was made a million times worse by the fact that her bond seemed to be giving way, if ever so slightly. I began to scramble for the door. I wanted nothing more than to leave that cursed place, that horrible young woman, and be home, safe in my bed. But as I grabbed for the handle, the door flew back against me, knocking me onto my back. Reverend Dutoit had burst into the room, his dry, ancient voice now booming through the stone room. At the sight of me, however, his shouts died in his throat. His pale gray eyes grew wide with panic, and his already pale skin became that much more paled as the blood rushed to his face. You. The question croaked out of his throat as he extended a long skeletal finger in my direction. You cannot. He said more firmly, though the mask of confusion never left his wrinkled face. We stared at each other for a long time, all the while the chained girl continued her screaming. Her name. He whispered solemnly his eyes sinking to the stone floor beneath him. Her name is Colita. She is my daughter. I know she hurt that young boy. He said, pausing. He was not the first. I know she would have hurt you as well, had you not fired on her. The man raised his gaze to stare at the auburn-haired girl and tears welled in his aged eyes. She doesn't mean to hurt. My Colita. She's sick, you see. Plague runs in her blood, cursed she is. I've tried for years to help her, to take the sickness away, but with every bloody moon she gets harder and harder to control. The man slowly removed an overcoat again revealing his bandaged arm and winced noticeably as he undid the wrapping. His arm had been gouged in three deep, rough slashes that could only have been made by very sharp teeth or claws. The wounds oozed a trail of milky pus as he moved, and judging by the clearly tentacling black veins beneath his skin, I didn't think he had much of a chance of surviving. Detroit stepped over me, his long legs swinging silently as he did and made his way to the chained wild form of Colita. She screamed and roared at him, gnashing her teeth and sending a spray of spittle across her father's face. He cupped her cheek, being careful not to lose a finger in the process, and started humming softly to her. It was a tune I'd recognized vaguely, though to place it proved impossible. Colita's fit steadily calmed as he sung, only her head drooped low and her body relaxed. He kissed her softly on the forehead and whispered something indistinct into her ear. After wiping the tears from his eyes, he turned again to face me. He walked softly towards me and extended a hand to help me from the floor. Come, he said. Let me make you some tea, and we can get you back to your parents no worse for wear. With that... He strolled calmly past me and into the cellar beyond. I did not follow. I reached out to the warped work table and firmly grasped a jagged, rusty scalpel. The reverend stopped just beyond the large iron door, and a cold stillness engulfed the air between us. I heard him draw in a shuddering breath and quietly pled. Don't. My blood burned hot as it pumped powerfully through my veins. 
I knew what I had to do. I had come here to confront the thing that killed Kaylin. And here she was, bound and waiting, being protected by only a frail old man. Time seemed to slow and I pivoted on my heels, breaking for the dog thing this man called Kolita. The Reverend barely had time to turn around before I cleared the distance and drew the blade across the girl's throat. Detroit's screams echoed around me and almost seemed to drown out the sound of a single gunshot. Shocked, I looked back at the ancient man as my brain tried to make sense of what had happened. He stood in the doorway, tears pouring down his face. In his left hand was an old flintlock pistol. Smoke danced eerily from the barrel. A barrel which had been pointed straight at me. I looked down and saw a steady stream of beautiful crimson pouring from my abdomen. I returned my gaze to the reverend before collapsing to the floor. My body felt cold as the life began to drain from me. There wasn't any pain, just a rapidly approaching chill unlike anything I'd ever felt before. My vision seemed to tunnel in on itself until I locked eyes with the fading light of Colita. There was little expression to be gleaned from those amber pearls, but I thought I could detect a kind of peace in those inhuman, collapsed pupils of hers. As the darkness closed around me, I swore I saw the faintest hint of a contented smile across her lips. I don't know exactly what transpired after I had lost consciousness. When I woke up the next day in the town surgery, people didn't want to say much, and mostly just told me to rest. From what I was able to drag out of a nurse and a few others that had stopped in to check on me, Detroit's gunshot and screaming had drawn the attention of a local vendor who was attempting to call on the Reverend, which had sent him running into town and raising an alarm with anyone he could find. Townsfolk stormed the house and discovered Detroit cradling the now freed body of Kalita, and had found me bleeding out on the floor. When they tried to pry him off the girl's body, he fought back violently with the same scalpel I had used to rend her throat. In the ensuing struggle, Detroit was overpowered and killed. His mournful cries, I was told, echoed in each man's head like a dying curse before he finally succumbed to his wounds. The house and all traces of its unholy secret were burned to the ground after that. People asked me what business I had in that house and why the Reverend saw it fit to end my life, but I said nothing. My silence was chalked up to shock brought on by the traumatic experience. No one questioned me about the girl with the auburn hair. She was just treated as an unspoken detail, and that was all there is to it. As for me, the bullet had done minimal damage. The surgeon said that the shot was one in a million missing vital organs and sparing me from nerve and spinal damage. I had made a full recovery in time, though when it rains or when I stop to think about it too much, the old wound cries out, refusing to be forgotten. I still think a lot about Kaylin, of course. It pains me to know that he'll never get to grow up. Instead, I try to live my life in honor of the boy. I spend as much time as I can to trying new things even those that frighten me, because I know Kaylin will never get to. I can cherish the memories for the both of us. I still don't fully understand the reasons behind what had happened, and perhaps it's better that way. The thing that took him away from me was gone, burnt to ash and buried beneath a mound of rubble, destined to be forgotten. <laughs>